This is a Vault Studios production. One of the things Kentucky is known for, well, we know horses, but also bourbon. Barstown, Kentucky is actually called the bourbon capital of the world. And now the town is gearing up for the six-day bourbon. A few years ago, I spent a lot of time in Bardstown, Kentucky, the self-proclaimed most beautiful small town in America. But Bardstown has also become known for something else, a string of unsolved cases dating back to May of 2013 when a Bardstown police officer was ambushed while driving home for the night. Any idea what happened to him? I mean, I think everybody's got their theories, thoughts, but again, um, it'd be irresponsible to sit here and do this or do that, what could have, um, again, until facts come out and, and things point a finger to somebody. In the years to follow, a mother and daughter would be tortured and killed inside their home. Everyone has said that you know, they had no enemies, that there's no idea how something like this would happen. A mother of five would disappear. She did not just take off and leave her kids, ever. And her father would be shot and killed while hunting on his own property. We treat Tommy Ballard's case as a murder, and that's the way we investigate it. All five cases remain unsolved. This is negative attention, and we're not used to negative attention. Today, everyone's focused on us because some evil people, and I say people versus person, because we really can't say it's one person. My name is Shay McAllister. And I'm Madison Wade. We're both journalists, and for years, we've been covering unsolved cases on TV, talking to investigators and families of victims, all pushing for answers. Cases we haven't forgotten and still want to see solved. This is Beyond Bardstown, Unsolved. Shay, you've been covering the Bardstown cases for years now. And of course, you shared these stories in the first season of this podcast. What do these cases mean to the community of Bardstown, Kentucky? And why is it important for you to keep talking about them? So first, I want to just go back and talk a little bit about Bardstown, exactly where all of this happened. It's about 50 minutes south of Louisville, and it's called America's most beautiful small town. And it really is beautiful. It's a historic community. It's full of beautiful rolling hills and horse farms, lots of bourbon distilleries, known as the bourbon capital of the world. There's a really quaint downtown area with old shops, mom and pop shops and restaurants that are so welcoming. And the people of Bardstown are kind, generous, welcoming people. This really is a beautiful area right here in Kentucky. And when you think about everything that's happened there, it's quite the contrast to what you'll actually see if you were to visit Bardstown. All of these five cases happened in Nelson County. Some happened within Bardstown. Others happened outside of the city limits, considered a county case. But every single one is very close to the hearts of the people who live here. Many people who are born in Bardstown, grow up in Bardstown, go to school or a technical college, and then come back and raise their own families in Bardstown. So the loss of five people from this area is really personal, and it hurts them just as much now, years and years later, almost a decade later in the oldest case, as it did back when they happened. So we decided to do season one of the Bardstown podcast because these cases were so hard to believe. They just kept happening. And we knew that this was a story that would resonate with people across the country. And it did. Every single time I talk to any of the victims' families in these cases, they always tell me they cannot believe How many people know their stories and are fighting for justice and fighting for answers with them? Shay, it's really impressive work and it's really important work. I know we have some new information 
that we want to ask you about. But first, walk us through each of these five cases, starting back in 2013 with the killing of Jason Ellis. Of course. So this is the first of the five cases. It was May 2013, and 33-year-old Jason Ellis was on his way home from work as a Bardstown police officer. He worked the night shift at this time, which meant he got off sometime between midnight and 2 in the morning. He had finished some of his final runs. He had told dispatch that he was checking out for the night, and he was heading home. Jason lived really on the far outskirts of Nelson County, away from the city center, and he took the same route home every single night. That was right off of the Bluegrass Parkway. So on this particular night, he's taking the route home that he always does. He's going around an exit ramp and he notices a bunch of sticks and tree limbs placed in the middle of the road on the exit ramp. Of course, he's a public servant, he's an officer. He's off the clock, but he doesn't let these tree limbs just stay there. So he flips on his lights, gets out of his car, obviously going to move the tree limbs, and he's ambushed. Shot and killed, bullets ripping through multiple parts of his body. He dies right there on the exit ramp. And it was actually a passerby, a man who was coming home from work. He worked at a nearby bourbon distillery who pulls up, notices the flashing lights, and realizes that something isn't right there. Another passerby joins in. They take his radio, the radio attached to Jason Ellis, and are calling it in, asking for help. Hello, hello. Officer down, officer down, Bluefield Road. Officer down. You need to give us a location. Blue, old Bluefield, old Bluefield Road by the wire. There's been a tree leak on my something. Officer down, officer down, please emergency. Immediately, dispatch, hearing someone on a radio that is not a police officer, knows that something is wrong, and the news starts to spread. This was a devastating hit for this small town. It is devastating whenever someone who works in law enforcement is killed. But in this small town, it was the first time something like this had happened, the first time an officer was killed from the Bardstown Police Force. And Jason was just 33 years old. He was a husband and he was a father, married with two little boys at home asleep. His wife later shared with us that that night, Jason had taken a break from work to go and watch his little boys play baseball before getting back on the clock. And when the boys were going to bed, he called them and said, good night, I love you. Obviously, she had no idea that'd be the last time she talked to him. Since then, there has been tons of rumors, tons of theories about exactly what happened, who killed Jason, why they killed Jason, but police have released very little confirmed information, only saying that they get tons of tips on this. They're always working the case. But this happened back in 2013, nine years ago, and still, we don't know who killed Jason Ellis. And just under a year after Jason Ellis was killed, there's another tragedy. Walk us through the case of Kathy and Samantha Netherland. Kathy and Samantha Netherland are a mother-daughter. It was April 2014, just about a year after Jason was killed, and 48-year-old Kathy, 16-year-old Samantha were home, and they were brutally tortured and killed. Kathy was shot several times. Samantha was stabbed and beaten. Both of their necks were slashed. This murder was graphic. And it's hard to believe that this would be a random murder just because investigators say the look of the crime scene appeared so personal, so vicious. And it was graphic even for investigators who were there. This murder, the Netherlands murder, happened right outside of city limits, considered a Nelson County case. And soon after it happened, everyone started learning more about exactly who these women were. 
a mother and daughter. Kathy was a special education teacher, Samantha a sophomore at Bardstown High School. The two family told us had no enemies in the world. Everybody we talked to in the, in those areas just yeah, you know, if they didn't if they didn't know Kathy and Samantha, they you know, just talked to highly of how good of people they are. They had recently lost Kathy's husband, Samantha's father, to cancer. And this was already a really difficult time in their life. But everyone only had wonderful things to say about them. They were doing their best to grieve. They were doing their best to recover. Samantha, known for being a brilliant young student who had huge ambitions and was really going somewhere. And Kathy, a very kind and compassionate teacher who was beloved by students and family alike. This murder truly shocked the Bardstown community just because of how innocent these victims seemed and how graphic the crime scene was. The next case is that of Crystal Rogers, a mother of five who went missing in July of 2015. What's Crystal's story? So Crystal is 35 years old. She's spending the weekend with her boyfriend, Brooks Hauk, and the son they shared together. And it is Fourth of July weekend. The last thing that we know about Crystal was that they were out at Brooks Hauk's family farm feeding the cows. And then they went home to the house that they shared. Brooks says that he went to bed. Crystal stayed up playing on her phone. And he says when he woke up, she was gone. A couple of days went by, and nobody could get in touch with Crystal, not her mother, not her kids. Of course, this sends red flags and sirens immediately to family, who say this is not like Crystal. She does not just go off the radar. Nobody can get in touch with her. And just a few days later, Sherry Ballard, her mom, decides she's going to police to report Crystal is missing. And when it was Sunday and she still hasn't called, I started panicking. And I got really upset. Nobody's heard from her. And she's not returning anybody's phone call. And that's not Crystal. And on the same day that she reports Crystal is missing, Crystal's car is found on the side of the road. Her keys, her phone, her purse, all left inside the car. But no sign of Crystal. Immediately, her parents are concerned, her family, her children. Everyone starts thinking the worst, and they are begging for police help, but police are not coming. So they start their own search parties. They're searching everywhere they can near the spot where the car was found, which is right off of the Bluegrass Parkway, a really busy highway in this area. But they are searching fields, woods, creeks. They search overnight. They search into the next day and the day after that. I remember thinking, how are we going to find her? I could walk right past her and not even know it because it's so much brush here. You know, she could be under that and me not even know it. How am I going to know? You know, you can't see under all that stuff. That's how we started searching. Notably, someone who never searched with them, they say, was Brooks Houck her boyfriend. That was something that caught her parents' attention right away and investigators' attention right away. Brooks Hauk and his brother, who was a Bardstown police officer at the time, Nick Hauk, are brought in for questioning. They were not arrested. They were not charged. But interestingly enough, and Madison, you know how rare this is, three months after she goes missing, the sheriff decides to announce that Crystal is presumed to be dead and Brooks Hauk, her boyfriend, is the main suspect in her disappearance, but they do not make an arrest. That now is seven years ago. He has been considered the main suspect this entire time, but no arrests. And another twist in this case ends up being someone related to Crystal. In 2016, her father was killed. What happened? Another devastating blow for the Nelson County community, a horrific nightmare for the Ballard family. November of 2016, the weekend before Thanksgiving, Tommy Ballard, Crystal's father, was shot and killed while hunting on his own property. He had woke up that morning with his grandson, planning to meet his son and his other grandson out on a family property. And he got there first with his grandson, Crystal's son. 
And as they started walking out, getting a lay of the land, the grandson says he's going to go back to the truck and get something. And as he's walking back to the truck, he hears a gunshot. His grandpa, Tommy Ballard, is shot and killed. His grandson runs up to him, immediately grabs his cell phone and calls Sherry, who is Tommy's wife, his grandmother, telling her that something was wrong, that he needed help, he was scared, he didn't know what to do. Sherry immediately jumps out of bed. She says she gets dressed. Um, She actually talks about, you know, having regrets that she had spent time to brush her teeth that morning instead of just hitting the road. But she was in such a state of shock. Um, She was running red lights, finally gets to the property, runs down to Tommy, and she tells us that at first she didn't see any blood. She didn't know that um, anything was wrong. Something that sets this investigation apart is right away, the Nelson County Sheriff, the local investigators that had been working Crystal's case, stepped away and said, this is too big for us. They called in the Kentucky State Police, and the state police have led the investigation from the very day it happened. I think this was the case that made everyone stop and say, hold on a second, exactly what is going on in Bardstown? With this being such a small town, people talk. Everyone knows everyone. With all these violent crimes happening so close together, a lot of people have wondered if any of these cases could somehow be connected to each other. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course. I mean, that, Madison, is the number one question I get whenever I do any kind of speaking event or even just sent into my Facebook is, what is the connection? There's got to be a connection. And it's hard to believe there isn't, right? Bardstown is a really small Kentucky town. Most people, if they don't know each other directly, they know someone who knows someone who knows that person. Now, the idea that these cases might be connected is especially understandable in the murders of Crystal Rogers and Tommy Ballard. I asked Kentucky State Police Trooper Scotty Sharp about those connections when we were covering these cases for season one. Well, you know, right now, that, that's still part of the investigation. You're going to hear that a lot from me today, unfortunately, but that's just the way it is. Um, you know, right now, we have nothing that, uh, no evidence that connects them to together, but obviously there's speculation in the community. We also asked Tommy Ballard's father, Till Ballard, a few years ago about any connection between Crystal's and Tommy's cases. I think the same people that murdered Crystal has something to do with Tommy's death. And I'm not the only one who thinks that because I've had I've had business people come up to me and I won't mention their names and tell me who they think murdered Tommy. And I put I won't call no names, but I put a state trooper on the spot, and I asked him. I called two names, the one that killed Tommy and the getaway driver. And he said, well, we're talking about, we're thanking the first person you named, but we don't know about the second one. I hope I live long enough to see him burn in hell. That's the words I said, and that's what I mean. But it, it's hard to think that, you know, they're the ones that murdered your grand, my granddaughter. And, uh, you know, and like I say, there's nothing you do about it. So when it comes to an official connection, and by official I mean something that police or investigators have confirmed, it's really been very minimal. Investigators are hard-pressed to say, yes, these cases are connected. But what we have heard is from the FBI. The FBI investigators on this have told us they are collecting tips for all of these cases because they truly believe that answers in one could lead to answers in another. So, of course, they're not saying that these are directly connected, but they do believe that solving one might start to a string of solving the rest. The five Bardstown cases between 2013 and 2016 are still on the minds of many who live in the area. There's a lot of old country roads out here. 
like more towards like Younger's Creek down by where um, Brooks's farm is. It's an odd feeling down that way because me and my kids would always go to the creek and stuff and there's something about those woods over there. I don't know what it is, but it's just not a very good vibe. Even just driving down the Bluegrass Parkway. I don't know what it is. May marked nine years since Bardstown police officer Jason Ellis was killed on the way home from work. And November will mark six years since the killing of Tommy Ballard, the last of the five cases. As the years have gone by, there haven't been many updates to share when it comes to most of the cases. But investigators have announced a number of developments related to one of them, the disappearance of Crystal Rogers. Over the past two years, the FBI has been back in Bardstown on multiple occasions, including searches conducted at multiple properties in August of 2021. We will have guys here and they'll be here until uh, the FBI tells us they're done. We're here for the long haul. At the end of the day, like I said, uh, it doesn't matter who solves it as long as it gets solved. It's not about the Nelson County Sheriff's Office. It's not about the FBI. It's about closer to the family and uh, putting the people uh, behind uh, bars uh, at the end of the day. Let's go through all the updates over the past couple years in the Crystal Rogers investigation. The FBI was back in Bardstown last year. What came out of those searches and what else did you learn at the time? So the first time that we hear about the FBI getting involved in this case is summer of 2020. Crystal, at this time, had been missing for five years. It was actually right around the five-year anniversary when the FBI announces that they are going to be taking over the case. And they announce that with a bang. They bring in hundreds of FBI agents to Bardstown. They tell us they have dozens of search warrants they plan to execute. They tell us they have hundreds of people they plan to interview. And we saw that start on that same day with a search right at Brooks Houck's house. They pulled out boxes and boxes labeled evidence. They actually also had IRS workers there helping them go through things. You know, I'll never get this image out of my head while they were searching his house. I'm talking about dozens of FBI agents combing through Brooks Houck's home. Brooks was on a lawnmower, mowing the grass through the whole thing. I mean, it is something that you can just not forget. So that happens in 2020. And right around the time that the FBI actually takes over this case, there's human remains found in Nelson County. Possible human remains discovered in Nelson, Nelson County late last week are undergoing testing at an FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. The family of missing Bardstown mother Crystal Rogers has been notified and is waiting to hear some news. Shane McAllister, of course, has been... They were found the on the side of a riverbank. Fishermen had found them. And the Nelson County Sheriff's Office told us that the FBI was going to be helping recover them. So, of course, everybody jumped to conclusions right away, thinking, okay, the FBI steps in, human remains are found, this has got to be Crystal. This has got to be Crystal's remains. We then did find out many, many months later that they were not Crystal's remains. Right now, we have some breaking news. The FBI says the human remains that were found back in July near the Nelson and Washington counties line, they do not belong to Crystal Rogers. Right now, they do not have a match for those remains. But again, they tell us it's not Crystal Rogers. And this came after extensive testing. These remains were so decomposed that it was incredibly difficult even for the best forensic experts in the country at the FBI lab in Quantico to get usable DNA from the remains. They at first told us it was a woman. They told us an age range. Everything was matching Crystal. And then they said it came back not Crystal. And in fact, we still don't know who that person is. They have not been able to make a positive identification there. So then the FBI goes quiet for about a year. And and then it's August, September of 2021, when the FBI is digging. They're back in Bardstown. They're focused in on this particular property in a neighborhood not far from Sherry Ballard's house. 
What we learned about this property from property records was Brooks Houck owned the property and was doing construction on the property many years ago, right around the time when Crystal went missing. People who live in the neighborhood tell us they remember him pouring concrete right around that time. And what started as a cadaver dog roaming the entire property eventually ended with them narrowing in on the driveway, digging up the entire driveway piece by piece. And they tell us that they found multiple items of interest. Of course, everybody wants to know what they are. The FBI really keeps that pretty tight-lipped for a while, um, not revealing, but but urging people to come forward with information and saying, hey, we're getting closer here. We're finding items of interest. We need to talk to you if you know something about this case. And all of those items were sent again to the Quantico Lab FBI forensic experts in Virginia. So during this time, all of the searches were focused on the Crystal Rogers case, but the FBI told us they were also investigating all of the other unsolved cases in Bardstown as well. They were collecting tips on these cases, and they told us, again, they think solving one might solve the rest. So they were interested and are interested in all of them. So, Shay, where does the Crystal Rogers investigation stand as we sit here in the fall of 2022? So what we know about the FBI case right now is, according to Sherry Ballard, the FBI has started wrapping up their case. They have a lot of the pieces that they need, and they are working now with prosecutors, local prosecutors, to start building a case that could lead to criminal charges. The FBI special agent, Jody Cohen, told us in November of last year, they are 99% confident that they will solve Crystal Rogers' case. And I know Sherry is so frustrated every single time another year passes and they don't have answers, but she tells me she too is 99% sure, if not 100% sure, that one day the FBI is going to be the agency to finally close this. And Shay, I mean, you speak to her a lot. So when you last talked to her, what did she tell you? I do talk to Sherry pretty regularly. Um, We've worked so closely on her daughter and her husband's case over the years that she has certainly turned into a friend, you know, someone who I care about getting answers in this case. And she's been so generous with her time and her information as we cover it. Plus the Ballard family, you know, it's hard not to love them. They are so kind. They're so welcoming and they're a huge part of the Bardstown community. So I most recently talked to Sherry about exactly what she knew in regards to the FBI's investigation and and if she was losing hope, if she was still feeling hopeful, if she had any idea where it was standing at this time. When I sat down to speak with Sherry, it had been exactly one year since those FBI searches, the big dig at that driveway. So that's what we started off talking about. So first, Sherry, it's been one year since the FBI was here in Bardstown digging up a driveway. There was so much hope this week last year that this could be a huge break in the case. Yeah. How are you feeling one year later this week? I'm tired of waiting. (laughs) Very, very impatient. Um, When that happened, you know, it just, and, and, you know, I know the FBI was excited about that also. So, you know, they got my hopes up too, and I try not to do that because I know it's a slow process, and I know they have to get all the DNA and all that stuff. And so until I hear something for concrete, I try not to get upset about it. But it's it's hard at the same time not to. And it's hard for me to realize it's been a year since that happened and I'm still sitting here waiting for something to happen. Have you heard anything from the FBI that makes you believe they are closer to finding answers here? Uh, I know they're in their the last steps. You know, I know they're getting closer. Um, they're close and my close is not the same thing. You know, I'm wanting this done seven years ago and and I, I realize why they do it. You know, like they tell me, we have one shot at this and it has to be done right and with everything, you know, that they could possibly get. 
But there's going to come a time when I'm like, it's time. It's time to move forward with what you got, and I just have to take my chances and, and go with that. When do you think you're going to reach that point? I would think soon, but I said that a year ago, and I'm still sitting here waiting. But they don't make me think it's not going to be, you know, far away. Something else I asked Sherry is if she's as hopeful now as she was one year ago. I, I do. I do still have that same hope. Um, and I, the, the FBI guy that's doing this is excellent. I, I have no complaints about him at all. He's doing an excellent job. It's getting all the prosecutors and all that on board and getting them where they need to be at, you know, is where the area I need to work on more than anything. Um, but I think the FBI is doing an excellent job. Um, they're very good about keeping me informed. Uh, you know, there's only so much they can tell me, certain things they can, and I understand that, and, and I respect that, because a lot of stuff got leaked that shouldn't have on this case, and so I'm very happy about that. But I'm very optimistic about justice coming. Shay, you mentioned during the searches last summer, investigators dug up part of a driveway. I know there's been a lot of questions about what exactly investigators found under that driveway. Is this something you asked Sherry about? It is. And Sherry couldn't reveal any specifics, but she did talk about those items of interest that were discovered. Yes, ma'am. I was told the day that they found it. And um, it was it was very it's a very hard time for me because what they found could very well be evidence that they needed. Um, I don't know for sure, you know, whether that evidence has been denied or or if they've went any further with that. You know, some stuff they don't tell me everything. Um, but but I was very optimistic when when they came to me, and they they kept me very informed when they were doing that search. They called me every afternoon and kept me updated. Um, you know, not everybody does that. You also asked Sherry what she would say to all the people who have stood by her and given her support over the years. What'd she tell you? Yeah, Madison, that's something I've talked to Sherry about a number of times over the years. She always gets really emotional when she talks about all of the support. It clearly means so much to her, knowing how many people around Bardstown, around Kentucky, even around the country want to see her daughter's case solved. I get upset every time, you know, y'all ask me that. Um, I am so blessed with people behind me. I couldn't have done this, you know, if, if they weren't standing behind me. But I have people still come up to me all the time. You know, you're, you're going to get your justice. You know, they're, we pray for that every day. I have so many people out there praying for me for justice. I do not believe that I'm not going to get it. I just, I just do not believe that at all. Um, you know, I still have people that have come up and hug me, and I, a lady came up to me in Walmart the other day, and she had on her prayers for Crystal shirt, and you know, she she had on one that was you didn't see a lot. So I'm like, for her to have that one, you know, was pretty special, and and for her to come up to me and just let me know. You know, I, I don't mind people coming up to me. If they come and ask me questions, you know, I get offended then. But if they come up and just tell me they pray for me and they show me something like that, I just sit in the store and cry with them, you know, and it means a lot to me. Very touching. On her husband's case, did she have anything to share about the investigation and where it stands? She didn't really talk about Tommy's case specifically, and the FBI investigation does appear to really be focused on Crystal's case. But Sherry has always said she believes answers in Crystal's case will lead to answers in Tommy's case. I actually think it's easier for her to stay focused on her daughter's case, knowing those efforts will help in the other investigations as well. And this past summer, you also spoke to one of Crystal's daughters, Tori. She's now 18 but was 11 when her mother disappeared. This was the first time you had a chance to speak with her, so what'd she share with you? Well, Tori has gone through middle and high school without her mom. It's hard to believe at this point, you know, she's almost had as many years without her as she had with her. 
But shielded from the public eye when she was younger, Tori is now 18 years old, and she wants to take a larger role in sharing in her mom's story. A lot of kids do grow up without their moms, but not knowing where she's at is what really impacts me the most. I feel like she was just here yesterday. At the same time, I feel like I haven't seen her in a long time. I just feel like a big hole has been left in my heart where she should be. Tori told us that she was enrolled at Eastern Kentucky University for a time, but she's since decided to move back home so she can support her family and be there if any news comes down about the investigation. Just in case something does happen, I need to be there for them. Mm -hmm. And I need them to be there for me too. In all of these cases, so many family members have been left waiting for answers. It's true. I mean, four different families, five different people. There's a lot, a lot of family members desperate to know what happened to their loved ones. Jason Ellis's family, he has sisters in Cincinnati. His wife has since remarried. You know, they're raising their kids right here around the Louisville area. And they tell us they think about Jason every single day. They don't do as much media anymore, but they're still pushing for answers. And I'll tell you, anytime something happens in Crystal's case, they're calling me, asking if I've heard anything that relates to Jason. You know, they are completely dialed in. As far as the Netherlands case, they're a little bit more removed. They've asked for privacy, and we absolutely respect that. They don't want to be involved in media coverage They don't want us to call them, and so we respect that. But if they were to ask us, of course, you know, we'd tell them everything we know. It's hard in all of these cases. You know, for one thing, we're we're sharing these stories with the public, and we want all of the people who support the families to know what's going on. You know, but our our top priority is always to respect the families and, and do what's right for them. Absolutely, and the goal here is to help. And on that point, So many tips have been pouring in from the public. So have you talked to investigators about if those tips have helped? Definitely. We check in on that all the time. The FBI tells us they have received hundreds of tips since they took over. That's not just in Crystal's case. That's in all of the cases. And they are actively collecting tips in all of the cases. The state police tell us they get about 25 tips a year in the Tommy Ballard case, But we know every time we do a story, we release something on the podcast that reignites attention and that helps bring in new information. We don't have exact numbers on the other cases, but again, the FBI tells us they are collecting tips, they are following leads on every single one of the Nelson County unsolved cases. And Shay, if anyone listening right now has information about any of the Bardstown cases, What should they do? Who should they call? So there's two great resources for this. First, you can call the Kentucky State Police at 270-766-5078. Or if you want to go directly to the FBI, they have a very easy tip submission portal on this new task force website. It's called crystalrogerstaskforce.com. I know one day this is going to happen. The only thing is it's not happening soon enough for me because I'm ready for it. I've waited seven years and I'm, I'm ready. Beyond Bardstown Unsolved is a production of Vault Studios in partnership with King 5 in Seattle, WHAS 11 in Louisville, and ABC 10 in Sacramento. Make sure you don't miss any future episodes by following or subscribing to the show wherever you're listening right now. And to talk about these cases with other listeners, be sure to join our Facebook group, Unsolved Insiders. Beyond Bardstown Unsolved is hosted by me, Shay McAllister, and King 5 anchor and reporter, Madison Wade. Our producer is Reed Redman, and our executive producers are Will Johnson and Brian Weiss. Thanks also to investigative journalist Andrea Ash. Audio mixing is done by Richard Humphreys at Tacoma Media in Silver Spring, Maryland.